Hello, everyone. Welcome to CIFAR's virtual talk in our series, Science is the Exit Strategy. For those of you who may be new to CIFAR, we are a global research organization based in Canada. Uh, we convene extraordinary minds to address important questions facing science and humanity. I'm Rebecca Finley, and it is my pleasure to be hosting today's talk on governance, tech, and the pandemic and to explore the questions, what do the debates on contact tracing apps in Canada and the UK tell us about the broader policy and governance questions related to AI, tech, data, and novel technologies? And how can policymakers navigate these questions effectively? And to do so, I'm really delighted to welcome Michael Geist and Carly Kind. Michael is a law professor at the University of Ottawa, where he holds the Canada Research Chair in Internet and E-Commerce Law. He is the editor of several technology law publications and an internationally syndicated columnist on technology and the law, the author of a popular blog on Internet and intellectual property law, and the host of his own podcast, Law Bites, of which I should say I am a loyal subscriber and I uh, heartily urge people to listen in. He has received numerous international awards for his work and has been appointed to the Order of Ontario. Carly Kind is the director of the Ada Lovelace Institute in the UK. It is an independent research and deliberative body with a mission to ensure data and AI work for people and society a human rights lawyer and leading authority on the intersection of technology policy and human rights. Carly has advised industry, government, and nonprofit organizations on digital rights, privacy, data protection, and corporate accountability. She's worked with the European Commission, the Council of Europe, and many UN bodies. The catalyst for today's discussion with Carly and Michael is CIFAR's report for Canada's Chief Science Advisor, Dr. Mona Niemer, on society, technology, and ethics in a pandemic. We were fortunate to assemble a impress an impressive group of experts, both here in Canada and internationally, to provide advice to this report over a very few busy weeks in April. Chaired by Anne McClellan, the group met virtually several times, published a report for the Chief Science Advisor, and laid out principles and implementation guidelines for contact tracing apps in Canada. Michael was a member of the expert advisory group that we brought together to author the report, and Carly was a member of the International Expert Roundtable that provided advice to the report. They have both been active in the public debate on technology and COVID, and I'm really delighted that they can uh, join us today. So uh, we're going to get started, but before we do, two quick housekeeping notes. Uh, first of all, language. I just want to say that I tend to use contact tracing apps interchangeably with risk exposure and prox proximity notice apps, uh, and the many other uh, names that have been given to apps. So I appreciate the difference. I was looking today, I think there's over 40 countries that have announced their intent to either launch an app or have launched an app already. So I just want to apologize in advance that I tend to use contact tracing, but I appreciate that there are subtleties and differences in the language. Um, and we can talk a little bit about that. And then secondly, I just want to say that today's session uh, will last up to 45 minutes. Uh, if you have a question, please submit it through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Also, we will be recording today's session, so you will be able to download it uh, and share it next week. So Michael and Carly, it's uh, really great to have you both uh, here. Um, when we were chatting a little bit last week, I shared with you that I had recently done a talk with Sir Tim Besley, who's an economist at uh, the London School of Economics and a CIFAR fellow. And we were talking just about this, this question of providing policy advice to government. So experts and scientists outside of government, how do you do it? And, and he noted sort of two general principles in the work that he did. First of all, that experts can provide a framing or a framework within which policymakers can get a sense of sort of the pros and the cons and weigh the risks and benefits of what are complex policy decisions that they themselves will need to take. Uh, and secondly, uh, that experts can really sort of provide a long-term view, maybe sort of really try to give a big picture and a sense of the, of the potential implications of what might have to be a rather hasty 
policy decision. So we talked a little bit about sort of framing the discussion around contact tracing apps and novel technologies in a pandemic sort of within that within that context in terms of what we were hoping to accomplish today. Um, so really sort of sort of step back and sort of give some sense of the bigger picture, take the longer term view and what might be some policy questions that emerge out of this discussion that should be part of a broader uh, policy debate moving forward. So um, to get started, I think it would probably be useful just to do some level setting between what's happening in Canada uh, and what's happening in the UK in terms of the launch of contact tracing apps and other uh, health identity technologies that are emerging during the pandemic. Michael, can you sort of cast your eyes back to, I don't know, mid-March? Seems like a long time ago. Uh, and Give us a sense of where things are today in Canada. Sure, I'd be happy to. And thanks again for the invitation to uh, to participate in this. So, I mean, I think back in March, we saw this mad rush from many other countries. I think some even described it as its own virus to try to come up with uh, new technologies, particularly around what I guess we'll describe as contact tracing apps. The same was true in Canada. As we looked at what was taking place elsewhere, we had many of our political leaders and others that started entertaining some of these possibilities. It was, I think, a fair amount of that was taking place below the radar screen in Canada. So we didn't have any formal announcements, at least we didn't have anything formally announced very quickly. But we did have a whole series of different initiatives where we had sometimes some of the scientists in the AI field and the tech field groups from Shopify, for example, working on different potential solutions. We had privacy commissioners sort of pop up and say, you know, we want to ensure that you're considering some of these kinds of issues. We had law and policy people who were also expressing some of their views and potential concerns around some of these issues. We had the CIFAR group that you just mentioned. So there was a lot of that kind of work. Where we've moved, I think, over the last couple of months is that at the provincial level, we had our first, I think, more full-scale experimentation with one of these apps in Alberta, the AB Trace Together app, uh, which uh, went live in early May. So it's been around for a couple of months now. There's also been a full review that was conducted by the Alberta Information and Privacy Commissioner, Jill Clayton. Uh, you mentioned my podcast and uh, Commissioner Clayton appeared on it. Uh, and I thought provided a really some really interesting insights, both into some of the positive benefits that she saw with the app, as well as how it was rolled out, but some of, also some of the lingering concerns. For the rest of the country at a, at a national level, there is still, I think, a, perhaps to some surprise, a little bit of uncertainty about what precisely we're going to get. I mean, the latest announcement uh, is that the federal government is coming forward with an app. It is using some of the work that was done uh, through some people at Shopify and others. And Ontario will be the first test grant, testing ground for this. This was supposed to have launched several weeks ago. It still has not launched. The Canadian Digital service has has a beta test that is ongoing right now and it's closed for new new participants but they are at least testing something uh, and i think as recently as just yesterday the logic reported that there were several other provinces that are anxious to become involved in the federal app so there is some amount of momentum for an app that the reality is the virtually no canadians have had the chance to use yet it is late in terms of being made available. And I think there are some lingering doubts um, about effectiveness of apps, given the experience that we've seen elsewhere. We are a little bit in a late mover advantage situation where many others have moved faster than we have. We can, I think, learn from some of those experiences. And one of the things that we've learned is that perhaps the enormous emphasis on apps that we saw back in March was somewhat misplaced. Great. Thank you, and I and I and I want to come back on a number of those points, but particularly on privacy. So so let's talk about that uh, when we move forward. Carly, I have to admit I've sort of lost the thread in terms of what is happening in the UK with with your app. So I'm really looking forward to hearing from you in terms of where where things stand. It's like the set. It's like we're in the seventh season of Lost or something when it comes to the app in the UK. So you're forgiven for not having uh, followed the plot twists and turns. Uh, I mean, lots of similarities with the UK. Uh, sorry, with Canada. But of course, you know, from the outset, some very different um, kind of fundamental differences between the two jurisdictions, key or well, central to which is the kind of centralised nature of the health system in the UK in the absence of a federal system, um, which means from the start, this has been a national initiative. And it's also useful to know that uh, in recent years, there's been a new body set up called NHSX, um, 
in the SpaceX tradition, which uh, you'll be unsurprised to know has remit for developing new technologies around the health system. So the contact tracing app that started being debated internally in mid-March came out of NHSX and was very much led by computer scientists who are either in the organization or affiliated with it through the National Center for Data uh, Science and AI, which is called the Alan Turing Institute. And that's where lots of the early kind of drive behind the contact tracing app in the UK came from, but of course was responding to this kind of international movement or building momentum around uh, in favor of contact tracing apps, which I think specifically came out of Singapore originally. Um, so in the UK, the, the plot twists and turns have included um, a big shift in government rhetoric from talking about the app as being central to the pandemic response to over time there being slightly muted government statements or claims around the app. So the explicit language changed from uh, this is no longer the cake itself, it's the cherry on top of the cake and, and uh, this is not kind of central to our strategy. Um, and that really, that really followed um, as testing um, was was undertaken. There was a, a testing um, of of the app on the Isle of Wight, um, which is a kind of relatively closed community of about 150,000 Britons. And as information came out about challenges that the testing was facing, the kind of government rhetoric was scaled down quite a lot. Um, but the other big uh, debate in the UK context has been the way the NHS decided to technically architect the app originally was to build a bespoke system that was about centralizing the data collected through the app um, in the hands of the NHS so that the NHS could run its own risk scoring algorithms off the data collected around proximity uh, uh, exposure notification and alert people according to up-to-date evidence about their understanding of particular local outbreaks. Um, so they chose to have this more centralized system which required more disclosure of data of, from individuals and um, uh, differed considerably from the decentralized approach that Google and Apple uh, decided to develop, building on the work of quite a number of researchers across Europe. Um, and that became a, quite a, a contentious decision on the part of the NHS that they chose a centralized rather than a decentralized system. Now, there was certainly some um, arguments in favor of a centralized system, including that it would enable more information to go into the hands of public health authorities. But there were a number of technical difficulties in rolling out the centralized system that the NHS developed, not least of which is that it simply didn't really work on iPhones because of the functionality of Bluetooth needing to overcome uh, the iOS requirements. So in the end, the NHS has been forced into a corner around that and has reverted to using the Google Apple API, so the decentralized approach. The Isle of Wight test, which was based on the centralized version, has kind of gone into the annals of history. We're now heading into phase two, developing a decentralized app. Testing is apparently about to start. Um, and I think we're you know, as Michael you know, put a quite nice spin on it about having a late mover advantage, I think that definitely applies to the UK. It doesn't seem like they're in any rush to roll out the app now. Um, I think it's probably fair that they've been a little bit burnt by the first experience. And um, there are some questions, I think, still around the efficacy of the app. I, I think they are still convinced that it's going to be a useful tool for them. Um, but perhaps the emphasis is more on using it as a way to order and return test results than necessarily only around exposure notification. So it's kind of expanding its remit, I suppose, at the moment. Hmm. Well, that's very interesting. Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, okay, so I'm going to now, I want to shift and, and ask you, Michael, a little bit more about privacy, but I want to do it within this context of public trust, because we talked a lot about the importance of public trust and both in terms of adoption of the technology, but then sustaining and monitoring and um, the technology moving forward. We talked about a lot about that in our report, Michael, but Carly, we picked up on that a lot out of your report, Exit Through the App Store, which you had released probably about two or three weeks before we did. So um, that was a very useful, so framing it within the public trust context. Michael, can you talk a little bit more about your conversation with the Alberta Information and Privacy Commissioner around privacy, the privacy impact assessment that she's done, where you think some of the uh, remaining 
remaining concerns are from a privacy perspective with an app? Sure. So I mean, I, so I'm happy to talk a bit about Alberta because I think there's some interesting things that come out of that. But I think more broadly on a national level, and I'll come back to Alberta in a moment. I think we're paying in Canada a bit of a price for having not addressed some of the privacy and data governance frameworks that I think many have been calling for an updating for many, many years now when it comes to this kind of issue. Because on the assumption that implementing and using this app is going to be voluntary, we're not a country, I think, where we would have a mandated requirement to install this app, then you've got to be able to convince the public both that it, I think, provides some good, but also that it doesn't do any harm and that you can trust both those that have created the app, those that may have access to the app, as well as all the various broader privacy and data implications. And so trust really is at the core, I think, of getting the kinds of adoption levels that you need in order to have this app reach any kind of effectiveness. And I think what we've seen in many countries is that it is very difficult to get to that point. And we see more broadly in society right now, people distrusting everything from vaccines to the information they get on COVID. So are they really going to trust installing an app that by design tracks where they are, or where they've been, as well as who they may have come into contact with. So it's a pretty high bar to reach. And I think in Canada, we haven't established the kinds of privacy frameworks, or at least updated our privacy and governance frameworks to be able, I think, to convince people that pay attention to those kinds of issues that we've got kind of the regulatory wrapping around this, that they should be able to trust this. That's not to say that many won't, I think, install these programs anyway. There's a great deal of concern and many will say that whatever some of my privacy concerns are, my health related concerns are even greater. And if this app will help and if they can be convinced that an app like this will help, I think many will say it's worth the risk. But I don't think that's a choice that people really should have to make. I mean, I think that these are the kinds of issues that we should have been addressing up until now and still should be addressing. And um, it is successive governments. It's not really a, a political issue of liberal or conservative. I think it's successive governments that have in, in many ways really failed us to address these issues such that when you start peeling back the onion a little bit and trying to identify, well, what law applies? What protections do I have? What are the penalties for misuse? It can be challenging to even, to even get the kinds of answers you're looking for at times because health is largely at the provincial level. These are federal apps that may be implemented at a provincial level. Privacy is shared to a certain extent, and it depends a little bit whether or not it's the private sector that's gaining access or the government itself. So there are a lot of those kinds of challenges. I'll note one, a couple of things specific to the Alberta app, which are things that we ought to be thinking about. And the privacy commissioner there found that they hadn't thought enough about. And those have to do in a sense with exiting the app. Is this a Hotel California type of app where you can check in but never leave? And I think there, are on, there have been concerns, people have raised this really from the very beginning. How do you ensure that once we hope this pandemic finally comes to an end, both how do I exit using the app and how do we ensure that this app, the apps become decommissioned such that the surveillance elements that are really baked into these apps aren't a legacy of COVID. And I thought that the, when the Privacy Commissioner in Alberta talked a bit about this, it became clear that there weren't good answers. Um, in fact, on the technical side, with the ability to the delete or stop using the app, there were challenges. And so you had to pay really close attention to be able to stop using the app altogether. And she found that the health authority in Alberta hadn't really spent much time thinking about when, the, when does this end and how do we decommission the app. And while uh, I mean, and at a certain level, that's understandable. People are running a thousand miles an hour, it feels like, to try to, to deal with so many different issues all at once. I think many in the privacy civil liberties community identified this as one of the core concerns that we could not allow surveillance style apps no matter how valuable they might be. And as we talked about, the jury is still out on that. But even assuming that they are valuable, given the current circumstance, we couldn't allow it to be the new normal. And we had to bake in those kinds of considerations about decommissioning the app from the very outset. And at least in the Alberta experience, it's pretty clear that that didn't happen. Uh, and we don't know enough yet at the federal level, uh, but one would hope that at least they'd learn that lesson in providing real clarity about what happens, not just in terms of getting people to use the app, but stopping use of the app as well. Mm -hmm. Great. So in this question of um, 
you know, public trust, which is informed by privacy, as Michael says, but also in terms of the terms of use and uh, around the app itself. Carly, the Ada Lovelace Institute has done some really interesting work on public deliberation and consultation around technologies, uh, particularly in response to COVID. I love the name of the report. It's titled, It's Complicated, <laughs> which, which it is. Um, can you talk a little bit, I think that would be a really useful lesson in Canada for us to get some sense of how you did that, where you thought the, the concerns were both in terms of privacy, but more broad, broadly in terms of e efficacy and other areas as well, and, and where you see that work going in, in terms of informing your work moving forward. Yeah, so w as an organization, we use public deliberation methodologies quite a lot. And by that, I mean uh, essentially long form public uh, focus groups, um, which are also often called mini publics or citizen juries and citizen assemblies. I'm not sure how much this is part of the policy discussion in Canada, but it's become a very popular thing to think about recently. And I think some of that responds to kind of political realities around these intractable issues, such as, for example, Brexit. There's this notion that you can start to bring together very disparate views on complicated issues through this type of long form public engagement. And we've been doing one prior to the crisis on the use of facial recognition and other types of biometrics technologies in the UK. But during the crisis, we uh, convened one of the first online citizen juries or um, citizen deliberation initiatives over quite a rapid period. So we did it, normally these can go for weeks or months. We did it over three weeks with 30 members of the public. And essentially what we do is we, uh, we turn them into kind of lay experts on a particular issue. We bring together a range of different experts and um, give the, help them present evidence to the citizens. And then the citizens deliberate on certain questions. In this case, what would it take to build public confidence and trust in a contact tracing app and other types of technologies around COVID? And it was a very uh, interesting and in, um, illustrative experience. It should, I should say it happened at the, against the backdrop of two um, events. One was the killing of George, George Floyd and the um, momentum around Black Lives Matter, which certainly has had an impact in the UK and came at the same time as a very important report, which showed that people from Black and minority ethnic backgrounds are twice as likely to die of COVID in the UK than white people. So the question of inequalities and structural racism very much rising up the agenda during the period of this deliberation. And the other was a slightly... Um, nonsensical event in which a key advisor to the Prime Minister was found to be breaking lockdown rules by driving to a castle in the north of England. Uh, it was a very English uh, example <laughs> uh, involving a castle, of course. Um, and that that raised these big questions around public trust and, and you know, does the government expect us to continue to comply with these quite onerous lockdown rules? Um, so we saw, interestingly, how those impacted the public's feeling around trust in government-based technologies. Um, but broadly speaking, we found that actually privacy and um, data protection weren't at the top of people's lists in terms of concerns around this app, although they certainly are there in terms of a building block that's required to build public trust. But first and foremost was that the public wanted to see a transparent evidence base around why this technology should be used. And um, they felt that that should be shared transparently and they were suspicious when any information was kept from the public. So the Isle of Wight trial that I mentioned uh, earlier, there wasn't very much transparency around that other than that, that it was happening and the public felt that that was something that undermined their trust. Um, there was also a lot of emphasis from the citizens on independent assessment and review of the technology. So they wanted to see independent ethics boards and independent oversight mechanisms, independent experts weighing in on whether the choices being made were the right ones. And they wanted to know it had been tested by independent experts. Uh, the third element was around clarity on the use of data. To Michael's point, they, they wanted to know when their data would be deleted, when would this app be stopped being used. And so there we found kind of support for the notion of sunset clauses, for example, or, you know, hard stops on some of this technology. And then finally, they, they were very aware that we needed to consider the system as a whole. So they were unwilling to consider the trust around the particular technology as separate from trust in the government and trust in the system deploying the technology. And that's where the questions about this special advisor breaking lockdown rules came up a lot. So it wasn't only 
do do you trust how you're using the app? It's but what about you know these political figures around the app and and do, do you trust the system in which it's being embedded? Um, and so I think those those kind of findings lend themselves, and we're working on something now, lend themselves to a you know how to do it properly next time um, type checklist because I think there are some really um, concrete things that come out from that in terms of what the government can do to um, to kind of be more transparent, to institute independent mechanisms, to make it clear when there are sunset clauses and when data will stop being used, et cetera, that can actually uh, increase public trust that are separate to, but on top of data protection and privacy protections as well. Great. So, I mean, I think those are all the, the questions, right, that have been swirling in Canada as well around the apps and sort of trying to get some understanding. So I think that's really important for us to learn from the process that you, that you put into place. And I want to come back on one particular item you mentioned, Michael, and talk a little bit to you about this notion of independent oversight, this capacity for evaluation and auditing by an independent body. Uh, who is that? Uh, we talked a little bit about it in the report. I've heard there should be a commissioner of sort of COVID contact tracing apps in some jurisdictions or an ombudsman. What, what do you think is the right way to establish that independence within all of the structures that are already in place in Canada? Um, but is there more needed? That's a great question. I mean, I, while there are some who have proposed specific commissioners, and I think that the experience in Canada and the prevailing view would be that the same kind of independent oversight that Carly just mentioned would be essential here too. My own view, when you're moving as quickly as you are, if you can rely on an existing structure that is trusted, uh, so much the better. And so if I look at the experience in Alberta where uh, they had, you know, they had, I think, really some really strong technical chops in terms of being able to take to look a little bit under the hood at the app, uh, and then take that and link it to underlying or the the governance framework and the legal framework to see where things uh, where where there were potential issues. I believe that our federal privacy commissioner would have many of the same kinds of uh, same same kinds of skill sets and same kind of tools within the office. Seems to me, uh, you mentioned Mona Nemer, the chief science advisor. I think the government has some of those people. I think the privacy commissioner operating as an independent agent is probably best suited to be able to deal with some of these issues. But I do think right now in Canada, we're, we're at a bit of a, in a bit of a dangerous, dangerous spot. I mean, we for months, as many Canadians will know, had the Prime Minister come up with a daily press conference, which may have confused a little bit um, regular FaceTime and press conferences with actual transparency about what's taking place. So there were a lot of announcements. I think there's less insight into what was really taking place or how some of the, some of the decisions were being made. And I think, frankly, we're seeing that being played out literally today uh, with some of the investigations into we and concerns around that particular program. And while there was this desire to address many issues all at the same time, which creates its own set of challenges, that really only enhances the need for transparency about why decisions are being made, establishing uh, protocols that ensure that science advisors and other experts are able to chime in and have an impact on what that underlying policy looks like, and then ensuring that once those things are rolled out, that you've got the independent oversight built in. Uh, I'm not sure that we're, I'm not convinced at this stage that we've done that all that well, to be candid. Um, we've put together these various reports. It's a little bit of a black box. I don't know that we know uh, to a significant extent precisely how that information has been used. And I'm not also sure that we have established as we are on the very on the cusp of trying to roll this out, I'm not sure that we even know necessarily how, um, what oversight mechanisms will be built into the process either. So I think there are some lingering concerns with respect to some of that oversight. And I guess I, I would conclude the response to your question by saying that if we take the position that we need to create something from scratch to address this issue, I think that that runs the risk of creating an even greater disconnect between having something launch and having the kind of oversight that you need in place, ideally from day one or even before day one, because you want to ensure that that, that oversight has played a role throughout the development process as well. Great. Carly, I wanted to, we've been talking a little bit about trust and trust in a government produced um, technology, but clearly these are public private partnerships 
as well. So in Canada, with COVID alert, it will be uh, Shopify and BlackBerry, and then the Google and Apple API as well that will be part of it. So what do you think are the extra steps that policymakers need to ensure are taken so that the public understands and can evaluate whether it's the procurement or the roles of private sector developers or firms that may participate in a government technology? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, in the UK, that, that hasn't been as relevant for the contact tracing app because it's been so firmly within the hands of the NHS from the start. Although I will say that in the public deliberation work we did, there was great concern around um, the potential sell, uh, sale of data to corporate entities. That was something that people wanted to see would be protected from the outset. So, um, and I think that echoes what other things we know pre-COVID about public trust in the UK in different institutions. So the NHS enjoys by far and away the most amount of public trust out of any British institution. And I would say broadly speaking, there's greater trust in government than there is in uh, companies in, in the UK. Um, but in terms of government um, procurement of tech systems more broadly or um, partnerships around uh, technology providers, there has been another um, initiative launched during COVID, which was uh, the establishment of what's called a data store, which is a kind of high level data analytics platform, which brings together lots of disparate data sources within the NHS to try to keep track of resource allocation, what beds are free in which hospitals around the country, etc. And that uh, project was um, launched with Microsoft Palantir and a small AI company called Faculty AI. Um, and the there's been quite a lot of concern raised about that by privacy civil liberties activists or advocates, sorry, and um, others kind of scrutinizing the information government system, governance system, uh, primarily because Palantir was um, awarded the contract um, with a fee of one pound and then the contract was renewed for a million pounds. And um, there was, you know, there was obvious concerns there about transparency, procurement processes, um, but also Palantir's history as being a defence contractor and the kind of ethical considerations, which are very real and substantial of a the British health system contracting with an American company that has that background. And I think that that has raised more eyebrows and raised some big questions about what it looks like to procure technology, in particular in the health system. Um, We've done some other citizen juries work around health data partnerships, looking at um, there has been some quite prominent health data par partnerships in the UK recently with between companies like DeepMind and Google and health um, and hospitals within the UK. And a big uh, finding from that was that in terms of what people considered to be fair, transparency is incredibly important. So they want to see contracts in the public domain. They want to see open procurement processes, but also they want to see um, equitable distribution of benefits from those um, those partnerships and in particular and I, I'm not sure if this is a UK specific issue but I suspect that there are similar questions in Canada there are geographical inequalities in the UK um, uh, you know between the north and the south in terms of um, deprivation and affluence and opportunity and jobs and the idea that health data partnerships or technology partnerships with with NHS trusts in different parts of the country might benefit some people more than others was was a um, cause for concern. So this notion that you need to have kind of a fair playing field across the country and that everybody should benefit equally was an interesting finding from that. And I suspect applies to other types of technology development, whether it be in the health system or other forms of government use of technology. Thank you. So now I'm starting to get some questions from the audience and there I have two questions and they're 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 similar because they both speak to sort of the efficacy of an app. Uh, one in terms of and, you know, the sort of the level of public, public adoption required, but also in terms of its integration or non-integration within a health systems data setting and otherwise. Would either of you like to speak to either of those points in terms of some of the considerations that we both both Canada and the UK need to be thinking about in terms of the deployment of apps and their actual efficacy and uptake within the within them um, within the population and maybe potentially Michael also in terms of mobility in Canada around, across provinces and and otherwise in terms of the population. Do you want to do you want to take a stab at that, Michael? 
Sure, I can start with a, just a couple of comments. You know, I, I think studies have indicated 60% or higher is sort of the number that people often cite. I don't know that we've seen many, if any, countries achieve that level. So it raises the question of how effective some of these are. Part of it, I guess, depends to come back to your very your intro, where we're using contact tracing apps as a sort of a, a, sort of as a as a broad term to cover a number of different kinds of apps, uh, and so. You know, in terms of the linkage to, to health information, in some instances, these apps aren't necessarily designed to do that at all. I mean, and so one of the ways that there is a hope to try to foster and gender greater trust within the public is to say the government will not have access to this information. This will be information that, that you will have. And so you will be able to be notified effectively through the app uh, as to whether or not you've had exposure to someone. And so um, you may want to get a test or self-quarantine and the like. Um, but that's not necessarily one that links directly into government data where there might be trends or other sort of information about uh, those that, that have this, much less apps that we've seen in some countries that have been, been designed to try to enforce quarantine, about trying to literally track where where people are going in the lake. So there are a lot of different uses that we've seen. I think Carly mentioned some other potential uses that people are starting to think about for those apps. And one would think even now, as we struggle with the issue of trying to get our kids back to school in just over a month, people will say, well, isn't there some role that these apps can play in that regard? Long-term care facilities, of course, have been one of the, the biggest sources of problems in Canada. Isn't there something technology can do there? So I think we see the prospect of these apps morphing into some of the kind of contact tracing that depends on fairly high adoption rates, potentially mm -hmm. into some other uses that are perhaps not quite so dependent on those numbers. Quickly on the issue of provincial issues, this creates a, a, some real thorny challenges from a Canadian perspective. And so I mentioned the Alberta app, and we've got an Ontario app. I live in Ottawa, and quite literally from my office at the university, you can see into Quebec. I mean, it's just uh, several blocks away, in effect, to, hit, to go to the bridge and go into Quebec. And so the idea that you'd have an app that works on one side of the river, but not on the other side of the river, doesn't make a ton of sense, um, given that there are many people who commute each day back and forth between the provinces for work and otherwise, at times where we're not seemingly mainly working from home. And so how effective is an app where it stops at at a provincial border, not really in terms of the way people often live their lives today, much less the desire to ensure that Canadians can freely move in and around the country, especially at a time when international borders um, raise some real issues. So how we overcome what is areas traditionally of provincial competence with national standards or a national app is an issue that we're still grappling with. You see that the, I guess the current approach is what we're seeing, which is Let's try it out in a province or perhaps two or three and hope that it is sufficiently effective that everybody jumps on board a sort of network effect when it comes to some of these apps. It becomes in everybody's interest to adopt uh, roughly the same approach and you get some of that interoperability of data. Great. Carly, thoughts on that? Yeah, I just wanted to share a resource actually, which I'm going to put in the chat and I, I, I think attendees can access it, but um, it links to a spreadsheet that we've been keeping updated, which tracks what we know about the deployment of contact tracing apps in various countries around the world. I think we've got about 50 different countries there. And it, uh, it goes to, the information in there goes to some of the questions raised here. So including around which countries are using verified test data or diagnostic data versus which countries are using self-reported data. Um, which I do think is a is an important distinction um, that has implications for how effective the app's going to be. And the other one is the level of um, uptake or penetration in countries around the world. I think Michael said earlier, we haven't seen very high levels of uptake in any country, certainly not higher than 40% in any country. And those countries that have had at the higher end, such as Australia, Iceland, and Singapore, have not reported any um, significant uh, benefit from the contact tracing app itself, but rather have said it needs to form part of a manual contact tracing system. Um, I think that even though, I mean, most studies that have been done in the UK in terms of what people say they will do in terms of um, using the app show that about 75% of people say they will use an app. But in effect, we know that that probably doesn't pe play out actually. So 
the Isle of Wight example being around 40%. Again, that seems to be where it tops out uh, around the world. Um, but I think there is a, in terms of the efficacy, there's a big unknown still, which is what do people actually do when they get a notification from an app saying you need to stay home now for 14 days because you've been in contact with someone? Um, I think that that um, behavioral question, you know, it depends on so many factors, including their trust in the app, including, you know, whether they think they were wearing a mask at a time that they were in touch with someone and therefore the app is wrong, whether they think other people are gaming the app. Um, but also, can they afford to stay home from their job for two weeks? Does their employer have some type of provision for compliance with social isolation measures, et cetera, et cetera? So those types of efficacy behavioral questions just haven't been answered yet. And we don't yet know from international uh, comparative experience how that's playing out. Great. So we have about five minutes left. So I want to make sure that I just pause for a moment and Michael and Carly and just ask you, we've touched on a number of different potential policy areas, whether it's privacy framework, uh, restricted use um, in terms of the data and the technology itself, questions of equity and inclusion, Carly, public engagement and transparency, harmonization and mobility efficacy. Are there, I want to make sure, are there any other really important policy issues that you think maybe are not as well known or not as focused on today that we need to be thinking thinking about as we take this question forward. And you each have about two minutes to respond to that. So I apologize, Carly, I'll, I'll ask you first. <laughs> um, well, I suppose there is a, for me, there's a, a longer standing question, which is what does technology development in government look like going forward? And what's the best practice actually for, for how government should develop and use technology as part of their policy making? And I think that the experience of the contact tracing app in the UK at least has been, you know, I think it will be studied for years from a kind of statecraft and policy making perspective because it it was, you know, in some respects just such a blunder in, in, in kind of many facets, but also brought out all these interesting questions about, you know, how does how does how does the the ideal or the hype around technology drive policy making? How does it determine the strategic choices we make? And what is what comes first, the chicken or the egg, the, the policy or the technology? And what is the relationship between the two of those? But also, and this is a particular interest in, uh, for me being someone who works on ethics and, and data, what um, what is the role of ethics boards, ethic advisory councils in um, in feeding into or overseeing the development of a government technology, in particular when they, those ethics boards don't have any teeth to stop the deployment or, or ask fundamental questions about it when they can really only tinker at the edges. So I think there's a, you know, that so many governments and, and companies are now paying lip service to, to ethics, but um, what does it mean to put it into practice in the context of policy making at at pace um, and technology development at pace. And I think then the, the other uh, just kind of issue we haven't spoken about, but it's worth referencing is um, how do we deal with digital exclusion in the context of policy that relies on technology in particular in the health sector? So in the UK, around 20% of people don't use smartphones. If a policy is specifically dependent on the use of a smartphone, how is that going to exacerbate health inequalities and health outcomes for the most excluded? And how do we overcome that? Fabulous. Thank you. Michael. That was a great answer, Carly. I, 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 I guess I would choose to, to focus on the issue of how do you move from expertise within the broader public and ensure that it somehow becomes part of your policy development. In other words, how do you do good science policy? And in Canada, we've had, we had a government for, that, for the last number of years, from when it was elected really, but a great deal of emphasis on consultation, right? It was, you know, sometimes we felt that it was almost too much consultation, that, that almost every decision had to be widely consulted. You had to have a lot of hearings. You had to then tell people what they heard and then perhaps consult on what they had said. And sometimes there was this frustration that we were never moving beyond consultation into uh, actual policy development. In this instance, there was no luxury to engage in some of that kind of broad, well, what do you think? You've got 90 days to let us know. And I think it's in certain respects, we have found ourselves wanting in terms of trying to be able to find uh, an effective policy development process, obviously at a moment of crisis, but at a time when there is the expertise out there in the community, a deep desire to become actively engaged. I mean, it's very clear how many people were just running to say, here, let me help. And I don't know that government had a good way to be able to take that and process it in an open and transparent way, such that we would get better outcomes. 
Instead, there was a little bit of who you knew uh, is who they would traditionally be talking to. There was a lot of talking up without a lot of clarity as to whether or not it was being heard at all. And as we've said, we still don't even know what the outcomes are necessarily going to be. And so I think we have to, coming out of this, recognize this won't be the last time we face emergency situations and want to try to tap into expertise. And we've got to be able to develop better mechanisms to establish good policy that don't involve two, three, four year cycles for how that takes place, but rather allow us to move much faster in the way that we would say some in the private sector and others say they've got to be able to react and move quickly. Government has to be able to do that as well. Uh, I think that's a perfect note to end it on, sort of where we started. Uh, that is the work. That is our work to do, I think, moving forward. And uh, the two of you have been in leaders in showing new ways in which uh, experts can and the public can speak and inform policy moving forward. So thank you both very much. Uh, I think there were well over 15 questions that I didn't even get to from the audience, so I apologize to all of the people uh, who had good questions. Uh, obviously, there's more here for us to discuss, um, but I really feel like we have supercharged the discussion today with Carly and Michael, so thanks so much. Um, I also just want to take a minute to thank Fiona Cunningham, Jackie Sullivan, and Wendy Hall. They were, they're the ones who made it, made it all happen here at CIFAR, and to encourage you all to visit our website, cifar.ca, to download the report we talked about. Uh, to visit the Ada Lovelace Institute website in the UK as well for many of the good resources that Carly spoke about as well. Uh, you can find out at our website more about this particular series, but also uh, to pick up on that recording of the talk if it's useful moving forward. Thank you all again. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Carly. Thank uh, you. Be well, everyone, and we'll talk soon.